I have an interesting topic today. It doesn't sound very positive, and I'm usually very positive with my service, but there is a positive aspect in that it might teach us some of the reasons why some of the things we desire in our prayer go unanswered. It's really what I'm going to be talking about. Why some of the things we desire in prayer go unanswered. And it says in James 4, 1 to 3, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. And here comes one of the key sentences. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it, one. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. That second half of that sentence, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. You can have your seats this morning. You know, when I talk about the topic, why some of the things we desire in prayer go unanswered, we already know that God answers every prayer. Yes, no, or wait. But I'm talking about the prayer sometimes that we really pray hard for that we want, and we don't get the answer that we want, and we often wonder why. And so I'm going to be talking about today, and maybe will help you and help us when we think of the things we pray for to see if they really are according to the will of God and what he really wants for us. So we won't become dis, uh, dismayed or disgruntled, discouraged. So we're talking about the prayers that sometimes God says no to. And I know Brother Carl's been saying it. I've been saying it too. As I look back on my life, there were some prayers that I asked the Lord to do that didn't come out the way I wanted. And I know at the time, in some of these cases, I was frustrated and disappointed. But looking back, as I look back honestly, I can see some of the things that the Lord said no to me were for my own good. Which brings me to my childhood. You know how parents say no a lot, at least my parents did. And you know, sometimes they didn't understand the whys. But as I look back, as I grew older, I began to understand why mother said, don't do this, do this, and do that. And it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father because He always has our highest good in mind. Keep that in mind. When you pray, God already has your highest good, His highest intention for you in mind. So we don't doubt that. And then we hear scriptures like, if we ask anything in faith, believing it shall be done. Or the Bible verse that says, if we have the faith the size of a mustard seed, we can remove mountains. And so we think about those scriptures and we try to balance them out and say, well, Lord, I've got that faith. Why didn't it happen? Why didn't that prayer get answered the way I wanted it? We hear a lot of preaching and teaching because it encourages us and builds it up, and I do a lot of it, on showing the power of prayer and how God blesses and how God supplies and God, how he heals, and that is all true. But we don't often ever hear anyone talk about, but what about the unanswered prayers, which a lot of us often have. We need to address that too. So that is the purpose of today's sermon. So we're going to be looking today at a few reasons perhaps why some of the things that we ask for, that we really desire, and we've exercised our faith to receive, don't happen. And so, in a sense, this might not be the most inciting topic, but it might be one of the most important ones that you'll hear in your lifetime, so you'll understand when you get a no from God. And there is lots of reasons for why we don't always get our answer. We're going to look at some of those today. Right off the bat, James said, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. Even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. James was talking to Christian people. He was talking about wars and strife that was going on within the congregation because Christians are still people. But there were people there were desiring things that probably God didn't intend for them to have and they were getting frustrated, so he began to teach them there is a reason why we just don't treat God like Santa Claus, everything we want, not 
considering if it's the best thing for us or if that's what God wants for us at the time, perhaps a later date. Christians not getting the prayers answered because of the wrong motives. It says that they were at war with one another. And when you're frustrated about prayer life, there also can be an internal war that's going on. You're saying, Lord, I'm praying for this. I'm seeking you for this. Why isn't it happening? A lot of people at some point give up their faith and say, God doesn't answer prayer. I quit. I don't believe in this faith life anymore. And so they're at internal warfare because they're always desiring to have something that maybe God doesn't intend for them to have. Or they're looking for power or recognition when they're desiring to be used of God, which is not the right reason to be used of God. And see, God sees our hearts and he can tell where our motives are. And so he will not answer those prayers. Conflicts, pride and quest for power not content with what they already had, but were always looking for something more. Always looking for something more and not satisfied with it. So there's an interior battle. Why doesn't he answer? Proverbs 13 says, 10, pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Are wise. Pride, covetousness, wanting stuff that God really doesn't intend for us to have. To covet means to long for or set one's heart desire on what someone else has. You know, there have been churches that have been ruined because there's a power struggle within the leadership. I should be leading. I should be doing this. And they're not even considering the fact that it is God who lifts up and brings down leaders. So we, we have to be careful, even as Christians, that we can get into this get a little political too as believers because we're still human with that carnal nature which still has a bent to sin. So we can be desiring things that God doesn't want us to have. Maybe never or maybe later we need to be patient. Wrong motives. And if you try to force it because there are some people, if it is not good will, they try to force it, I'll tell you. Even if you get a position of power by maneuvering about, God will not bless that. You may get that position. You may get that place. Because people, I've seen people work their way in the power in churches that God never intended them to have. They were able to force their way. But I have noted that people that have done that, God really didn't bless that ministry. It didn't really bless when they got there. And so checking our motives is a good place to start. Now we're going to get into some other things that hinder our prayer. There are other things. Deuteronomy 28, 15, and 23. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And listen to this. And the heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth under you shall be as iron. There are people that have been praying for things. I've probably done it in my past that God didn't intend for me. Praying for something, and you can feel it when you pray, that, you don't, that prayer doesn't seem to be going any higher than the ceiling in your house, and you know when it's happening. You're trying to force something, but it's as if the heavens are brass, and what does it say? The earth beneath you is as iron. So you're stuck in a very hard place because you're trying to offer a prayer to God for something that he doesn't intend you to have. We need to be cognizant of that. Have you ever felt like the heavens are bronze? I'm praying, Lord, it's just bouncing right back. Nothing is happening at all. I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. That's oftentimes because we're often asking with the wrong motives. And it also says, if we don't obey his commandments. You know what the Lord, there's blessings when they're obey, when we obey. There's curses, I'm sorry, when we disobey. Because we do so what we reap. So being obedient to the Lord as his servant is one of the good ways, to, good footing to start out and having a successful prayer life. And so... <clears throat> We want to look at some others, and some of these others that I come up to you uh, before, when we get there, may surprise you. 
we also need to learn to wait patiently. Psalms 41, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. Sometimes we give up in prayer too soon, which is another thought. We have to wait patiently for the Lord. We don't rush God. He has his own time. I've said it throughout the years. Oftentimes, and I've found this to be true, that God often works real slow. But if he's in it, but if he's in it, he's never one second late. That's right. I'm telling you. I know all of you here that are praying people. You're just like me. I've been praying for this thing and it ain't happening. And I keep praying and praying. And I'm just saying, God, can't you just kind of hurry it up a little bit? <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. But I have found out if God was in it, and if my motives were right, and it was in line with his will, and it wasn't just me desiring something for the sake of it, that God has always showed up and he's never been one second late. I've been in times in my life where I financially was strapped. I've been in times in my life when I was very ill. I was, God raised me from the dead way back in 1983. But he came through at the last second. God always does that sometimes. Yeah. So we have to learn to wait patiently for the Lord. And he's also watching the spirit that we have while we're waiting. Are we still loving him and caring for him and praising him and worshiping even though we don't get that answer right away? See, God is watching us. I've said it in the last couple of sermons. God is more interested in you than your problem. Yeah. Oh, wow, I thought he was a problem solver. Yes, he is. He will solve your problem, but he sees how those problems grow you. He's building your character in these times when those prayers are not yet answered and his grace, I guess, is sufficient. And so that's one of it. Another thing, too, I'm a Christian. I pray all the time. And something always seems to happen. Life is going very well. And then, boom, someone in the family does this. Somebody's getting a divorce. Someone's, it seems like it never ends often. And we need to remember that God never promised us a trouble-free life. He said, it's a promise, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've got overcome it, which means I will bring you through it. But, oh, I gave my heart to the Lord. I paid my tithes, and look what's happening in my family. Stuff often happens in the best families, in the best Christian homes. Those things just come our way because it is part of life. We live in a fallen world. In the beginning, when we sold it over to Satan, the whole thing changed. The ground was cursed, lifespan was shortened, everything changed. But we're living here by faith in God. But in this world, things often come our way. And you know what is so sad too, which I don't understand. I feel almost sorry for a lot of Christians. Seems to me, a lot of the most precious Christians I've known suffered the most. I mean, I've been at this for 80 years. Well, not, not all 80, of course, I was a kid. <laughs> but I've been in ministry for 60 years. I've looked at some of my relatives that are the most spiritual. They have the most problems. I don't always understand that, but I do notice that all of them continue to serve and love God no matter what's going on in their lives. They must have that faith. They encourage me. But there's part of me that, in a sense, I feel sorry for a lot of them who have been living really well and things happen. But they have not given up their faith in the Lord, which is a sign of a true Christian. Amen. Sometimes we don't get that promotion. Sometimes we don't get that reconciliation we long for. But God is still watching us. When those prayers are not answered, are we still crying out to him? Look at Job, when everything was taken from that poor man, everything that he had. But he still says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and even if he kills me, I will still worship him. That's what God saw in Job. And that's sometimes with us Christians too. We face these things that come our way. But God, yes, is with us. But difficult times will come. Strong, strong faith and character are built in trouble-free, are not built in a trouble-free environment. 
It is in the hard times that we are shaped into the image of God. I had a friend of mine in Torrance that had an office. He had two palm trees, inner, inside plants in his office. One of them was by the air conditioner, one of those in the wall ones we used to have before, some of us still have them. And that palm tree had continuous air blowing on it. The other one was in the corner, nice and healthy and away from everything too. But I noticed the one that grew strong and sturdy over the years was the one that had the wind blowing on it constantly. And the one that had no resistance just stayed the same. God grows us in our times of suffering. It's painful, but it happens. So our faith to persevere and endure during times of struggle is a challenge. But when I think of people, I think of Caleb in the Old Testament. It is said that Caleb had a different spirit. I love him. He was one of the spies that wanted to take Canaan 40 years earlier, but he had stuck in the desert with the rest of them because of their unbelief. But he never lost his hope waiting those 40 years. You know, Carl have often thought how him and Joshua and Moses, when they were together, surrounded by those thousands of unbelieving people, and they're probably saying, you know, Carl, Pastor Sam, whatever, we, we could have been there. But we got to stay here with the rest of this bunch because they listened to the other people. But see, for those 40 years, Caleb never lost his dream or his vision. And look at it, it says in Joshua 14, 10 and 12. And now, and I love this story, I think he was about 84 years old. I'm not sure. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now this day, here it is, 85 years old. Now therefore, at 85, waiting 40 some years, give me this mountain. He didn't say, give me the flat land. Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard it in that day how the Anakim, the giant is one that scared all the spies, not Caleb. You heard in the day how the Anakim were there and the cities were great and fortified. He says, it may be that the Lord will with me and I, at the young age of 85, will drive them out as the Lord said. This precious man of God, waiting 40 years for what God promised him 40 years earlier. His vision, his dream was still alive. Give me what God promised me. And I know there were giants there, but because God has promised it to me, give me my mountain and I will, by the power of God, drive them out. Wonderful story of faith and trust and lasting persevering faith by this wonderful man. Susan, my wife, used to sing with a choir. It was a very, very much alive Pentecostal church. It was called the Revival Center. I don't think any of you heard of it. It was on 89th and Hoover, really thriving in the 50s and 60s, a powerful church. She sang with a choir that was called the Sky Pilot Choir. It was led by Doris Akers. She wrote a song I didn't write it. She wrote it. Lord, don't remove that mountain. Give me the strength to climb it. I asked the Lord to remove all my mountains. I don't want, to, I don't want no mountains. I'm glad she wrote it. I would say, Lord, remove that mountain. But th this woman said, Lord, don't move that mountain. Give me the strength to climb it. You see where faith comes in? When we face opposition and trials, that's where our faith is tested. She really wasn't wishing for all hell to break loose, but what she was saying, whatever she faces, she knew, she knew things would come, that the Lord would bring it through. Trust in God. Thinking about that choir, I'm off the beaten path here, Pastor Cliff. These tangential things come along. Susan sang in the choir, and she said they used to be up in the choir loft. And the pastor used to have the column upstairs that the choir was ready to come down and sing. She says, they're not ready, pastor. That choir leader had all those 80, 100 members kneeling down in prayer until the spirit fell on that group. Then she would call, now we're ready. The Skylight Choir, that's how God moved powerfully 
And he's still moving today. But the idea here is, Lord, don't remove that mountain. Give me the strength to climb it. She didn't wish for problems, but she knew that whatever she faced, and I faced my mountains too, believe me, and God always gave me the strength to climb it. I often wonder, am I going to make it? Am I going to survive this? But God broke me, brought me through. Yeah. He blessed me. We face those mountains. I want to keep moving now. We have some more reasons why sometimes our prayers are not under. Unconfessed sin. Brother Carl leads us in our sinner's prayer every 8.30. Where we, in that prayer group, confess any sin that we have in our hearts. Because it says, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. Unconfessed sin, holding on to clinging to sin in our lives, doesn't please the Lord. Now, we all sin, but we're talking about ongoing blatant stuff that we shouldn't be doing, where we're making no attempt to overcome it. I already told you we've got that flesh that's kind of bent towards it, but we, we take authority. Don't make your sin your ally. Don't get used to it being in your life. Learn to dislike it like God does. Learn to hate it like God does. So that's what he does. I got a, a story I've often told too about this kind of unconfessed sin or allowing it to be an ally. <clears throat> My stepson who passed away told him a story of a friend of his who found a baby skunk near Torrance Park. Cute little thing, about that big, black and white, man. It was like a little kitty cat, right? And that thing was cool, too. He, put it in, he, he took it in his house and everywhere. And he was getting so good at it, he put it in his pickup truck. With, the, the skunk was right in the back of his seat. That was his little good old pet. And one day he was driving in Torrance. He had some railroad tracks, and that truck bounced. And that skunk unloaded on him. He threw that thing out the window. <laughs> My little cute little bee. Probably the same color as Maxwell. No, but, but, but he ain't a skunk. That's like sin. It becomes our friend. We get used to it. We get accustomed to it. We need to get rid of that stuff. Another thing, Mark eleven twenty four to 25, a bitter, unforgiving spirit. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that, you receive that it will be yours. But, here comes Pastor Cliff's but. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive and listen for your sins too. Relationships take priority over worship. Matthew 5. If you're praying at the altar and you know something's going, go make it. Don't keep praying there if you've got unforgiveness and bitterness. Christ forbids that. He says, go first, make it right. Go first and make Then come back to a new hope and offer your prayers to the Lord. Bitterness and unforgiveness will cancel a prayer. Someone once said, and I've seen it too, if you don't forgive someone and you're trying to bury them, dig two graves. Because you're killing yourself too. And I've seen it, and I'm seeing it kill some people that I've known because they've refused to let bitterness go. You won't get that way. Now we get to the other one here. This gets a little sticky, but marriage to husbands. But it applies to wives. First Peter 3, 7. In the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift in your life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Treat your wives. Treat your family. And it goes the other way too. Treat each other with love and respect. This is a warning to both. The Bible says when you got married, you became one flesh. The Bible says in Psalms, I believe, 133, that God commands the blessing where there's unity. In the book of Amos, I forgot where, maybe the third chapter, Carl could probably tell me right now. How can two walk together unless they agree? And we talk often about the prayer of agreement. You are one. My wife and I are one in the sight of God. And so we have to be united. We may have our differences, but we don't carry on stuff going on and endless turmoil in our family. 
we try to come to a place where we're in agreement, respecting one another, loving one another, and loving God, so that when we pray, God hears and answers. So how we are in the relationships with people. See, God is more interested in you than your problems. I keep saying it. He'll take care of your problems, but he's trying to fix you. He's trying to fix me to make us become more like him. Continuous turmoil. Treat her as you, sit, you should so your prayers will not be hindered. All those beautiful things. Now we go to reason number four. We hear this often. The lack of true faith in God. But when you ask him, he, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Now listen to the last thing. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Wow. If our faith is wavering, it's not that because we have some momentary moments of doubt. But I'm talking about, I want to trust not God. No, I'm going to do it my way. No, I'm going to trust God. Oh, I heard about this idea. Maybe God won't do it. Oh, I'm going to go back to God. You're unstable, unstable in your ways, like the waves of the sea. God will not honor that faith. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. That's pretty strong. That's pretty plain. Your faith must be in God alone. In God alone. I know as a pastor, and Pastor Clips, our lead pastor here, we don't want you, I know you respect us and love us and you have expectations, but don't put your faith in us. We're telling you to put your faith in God because we're doing our best to obey the Lord ourselves. And God is also working on us. And so that's the importance of who your faith is in. Is your faith in God? Faith is a mustard seed. Doesn't sound like some Christians brag about giant faith. I don't make no claims like that. A mustard seed faith. Where is your faith? Is it in God? That's all God wants to see. Are we trusting him? Are we loving him? Are we depending on him? That is the faith that honors the Lord. Because yeah. I've heard these giant killer faith people. That's okay if that's what you want to claim. But I make no claims of no such thing. I just put my faith and trust in God. And there are times too when I wonder, is it going to really happen? That's not not believing. It's just that human side of me. But I know ultimately my faith rests in the Lord. Unwavering faith in God alone. No divided loyalty. People with wavering faith will not receive anything. Also, said it so many times, God's delays are not always denials. He's testing our faith. Yes. Do you love him when you don't get your answer when you want it? Can you still praise him? That's what the Lord is looking for. You know, we sometimes get into this attitude where we want God to just give us everything and do everything for us. But do we really love him? I'll give an example of my wife. And I try to be the good husband and do the flower thing and all that stuff to Cliff. <laughs> I'm not the best that I could be. But by golly, Susan, I got to buy you a box of candy to show that. Can't you tell that I love me just by being there? Yeah. Say amen. amen. That's true. <laughs> He didn't buy me no flowers. He didn't buy me. Well, I know the, the importance of such stuff. But just being every day beside her, providing for her, protecting her, and loving her, God, you're enough. You don't have to give me flowers and candy all the time and make me feel good and pat me on the back. You're enough because I've seen you, your steadfast love that never changes, your ability to see me through everything I've been through, your ability to raise me up from a deathbed years ago, to heal me, to provide for me. If you never did another thing, God, I've seen enough. And that's what God wants to see in his people. Amen. Pastor Cliff says it a lot. We have so many people today that are ungrateful. God, we're so well off in this country. So ungrateful. Let's stand to our feet. In gratitude. Don't want to keep you any longer. We've got lunch prepared. But just, uh, we just wanted to give you some ideas. Some way and somehow, when some of those prayers that we are asking for don't get answered the way we want it, we will get some no's from God. But make sure 
that it's not for the wrong reasons. Make sure that it's in alignment with his will. Father, we come to you this morning. I thank you, Lord, because we often have to wait in prayer for things to happen. Lord, and sometimes the things we ask for you don't happen. But you know, it says that all things, that's another promise, everything that comes our way works together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So I've seen in my life, Lord, the bitter things, the devastating things, the great things, the wonderful things, as I look back, they, it all worked together for good. Everything worked together for good. So help us to not lose faith, not lose heart, to continue to pray, but to make sure, Lord, that when we pray, we're ex acting on our prayers in accordance with your will. Bless us today, Lord. And Father, I pray as we go to the dining room, there may be another prayer there. I pray that you just bless the food that we're to share today. We continue to bless Heather. We love her. We have mixed feelings today, if we're honest. We don't want to see her go, but God has called her, so we release her with our blessing. In your name, Jesus, amen.